I'm Harriet Vainsball, Associate Professor of Medicine for McMaster, and I'm delighted to have Professor Mikhail Kosi Barad from the St. Luke's Mid America Heart Institute in Kansas City here to discuss his Step Half Half Trial. Welcome, Mikhail. Great to see you, Harriet. Thanks for having me. We should discuss the problem of obesity and heart failure and uh, perhaps get into the risk portended by visceral adiposity. Mm -hmm. um, what has the background literature revealed about those conditions and the risk of heart failure? Sure. Well, you know, first off, uh, probably important to remind folks that half path is actually a huge public health issue, right? The prevalence is rising and over half of all patients with heart failure now have half path. And if you then look at those patients that have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, at least in the United States, at least 80% of those uh, patients have uh, overweight or obesity. So it's a most dominant, uh, the obesity phenotype of FFF is now the most dominant phenotype. And then if you look at uh, obesity and then more specifically, as you pointed out, visceral adiposity, it's uh, by far the strongest kind of a metabolic risk factor for developing uh, half F. Mm -hmm. And so the body of literature indicating that obesity and visceral adiposity are not coincidental, they're not comorbidities, they're not just coexisting conditions, but they in fact may be the root cause and the key drivers of development and progression of half path that literature has been really gaining momentum. And of course, that's what the rationale for testing semaglutide in a step half path trial is the therapeutic intervention uh, for patients that have half path and obesity was, uh, is to really try to understand whether if obesity is a root cause and a key driver, then if you target, directly target that root cause, can you actually substantially improve patient outcomes? And certainly GLP-1 RAs have had a remarkable impact on obesity. We see it in our patients. We see how they've improved not just metabolic parameters, but functional capacity, how people feel and function. Um, what hypothesis were you trying to test in this trial? Right, so the hypothesis was that if you target obesity, uh, with this mechanism, GLP-1 receptor agonists, in this case, semaglutide, a potent GLP-1 array, uh, that you will have a, a significant uh, beneficial effect on patient symptoms, physical limitations, quality of life, and exercise function. Uh, and uh, we constructed and designed the trial to directly test that hypothesis. And it's actually the first trial ever done to test whether uh, targeting obesity with pharmacologic therapy uh, can accomplish um, those benefits. We, there was previously a trial uh, testing lifestyle interventions in a similar patient population, but now with pharmacologic agents. And you chose a primary composite outcome of health status and weight loss. Yeah, d dual primary outcomes, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, and um, so tell us who you included in the trial sure. and who was excluded. Yes. So, uh, so we randomized 529 patients uh, with uh, half path, uh, a known diagnosis, established diagnosis of half path, and a BMI of 30 and above. Mm -hmm. And uh, these patients had to have um, ejection fraction of 45% or higher. Mm -hmm. So it was a true half path trial. Actually, the median ejection fraction was about 57%. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so in addition to this, they also had to have at least one of three things. Uh, either documented elevating left ventricular filling pressures is on the right heart catheterization or with a CardioMEMS device, uh, or, and or, uh, elevated natriuretic peptides with structural uh, echo abnormalities, mm -hmm. or a recent heart failure hospitalization with ongoing requirement for diuretic therapy or a structural echo abnormalities. And what was the anti-probin P threshold for inclusion? So the anti-probin P threshold was actually stratified by BMI. So right. it was a bit higher for people with uh, lower BMI within that spectrum, and a little bit lower for people with higher BMI. Okay, and what was the minimal threshold used? Uh, I, I, I believe that for the highest BMI, it was uh, anti-probin P had to be greater than 125. Okay. Uh, 125 yeah. and greater. 
I find it's a sort of area of, of confusion for clinicians sometimes. That's why I wanted to be specific because of the whole idea of deficiency in people who are obese. Um, and what were your findings? Well, uh, so what we found was that um, uh, semaglutide uh, substantially improved patient symptoms, uh, physical limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a nearly eight point improvement mm -hmm. in KCCQ clinical summary score, which was one of our dual primary endpoints and the gold uh, standard for measuring heart failure related symptoms and physical limitations. Uh, the uh, benefit of semaglutide versus placebo was already evident at 20 weeks, but it continued to be amplified during the course mm -hmm. of the trial. And there was actually the largest benefit we saw was at 52 weeks, which was the primary endpoint, uh, uh, the change between baseline and 52 weeks. Um, it was uh, very highly statistically significant uh, with a p-value less than 0 0.001. Uh, and uh, the second dual primary endpoint, not surprisingly, uh, people uh, that received semaglutide lost more weight, um, and the treatment difference was 10.7% in favor of semaglutide with a highly significant p-value less than 0 0.001. We also saw in terms of secondary endpoints improvements in six-minute walking distance, pretty substantial improvements. Um, we saw a significant reduction in inflammation. We saw a reduction in, in terms of exploratory endpoints, now reduction in, in terminal pro BNP. And while this was not an outcome trial and we did not uh, have a lot of heart failure hospitalizations and urgent visits, we did adjudicate those events. There were only 13 of them in a the trial. Right. Those were remarkable. Uh, but what, only one occurred mm -hmm. in the semaglutide group and 12 in the placebo group. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly a signal, a uh, very promising signal towards fewer clinical events as well. And finally, the safety looked really good as well. There were about half as many serious adverse events in patients treated with semaglutide versus placebo. What about tolerability? A lot of patients in clinical settings complain of GI side effects. Yeah, and some patients, of course, developed uh, GI tolerability uh, um, effects like uh, nausea, mm -hmm. uh, well known for GLP-1 receptor agonist class. And so more people treated with semaglutide stop the uh, study medication due to gastrointestinal effects like nausea. But if you look at the overall discontinuation rates, mm -hmm. they were almost identical between the two treatment groups, about 16%, regardless of whether patients were on semaglutide or placebo. So more people stopped semaglutide because of gastrointestinal effects, but more people stopped placebo for other reasons. So the overall discontinuation was the same. So you measured CRP. Did you measure pericardial fat or epicardial fat to see whether semaglutide decreases that? Uh, so we don't have any data to be presented on those types of endpoints. Uh, we didn't do body composition analysis or anything like that. We do have a very robust echocardiographic sub-study. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, the second sister trial that we're doing in people with step half, uh, it's called the step half half diabetes trial. It's in people with half half obesity and type 2 diabetes. The study we're talking about today excluded patients with diabetes because we have that sister trial specifically for that patient population. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, both trials have very robust echocardiographic sub-studies. So when the second trial is completed, we plan to um, analyze that echo data and there will be lots and lots of different things to look at there. I'm sure it will be a wealth of information to be learned, uh, but we don't have any um, imaging data to be um, uh, presented at this point. So what are your next steps in this line? You talked about the diabetes trial, but do you see the needs for a large outcomes trial in patients with half PEF, or do you think you've demonstrated on the background data that we already have in terms of MACE an adequate body of evidence to guide care? No, great question. Um, I, I would say probably a two-part answer to it. Um, I very strongly believe that patient symptom function and quality of life are critically important outcomes, especially in heart failure, uh, in their own right. Uh, and I think sometimes we obsess over hard endpoints, but if you actually ask the patient uh, what's most important to them, especially in half path where the patients are really symptomatic, in fact, even more symptomatic than patients with heart failure and reduced TF uh, on average, um, in well-designed studies, what patients will actually say is that, that they value their daily symptoms and physical limitations and improvement mm -hmm. in symptoms and physical limitations as much, if not more, than survival. With that acknowledged, I think 
that uh, it would be um, really great mm -hmm. to do an outcome trial because based on preliminary data we see mm -hmm. in step half path in terms of clinical events there is a lot of promise mm -hmm. and I think it would really help uh, even in a more compelling way mm -hmm. uh, establish the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists in this patient population as the next standard of care. Right, and certainly the threshold um, that was achieved, you know, improvement and a score of eight was well beyond the minimal clinically important difference, typically beyond the range we see with other interventions. I think, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. It's an important endpoint that you demonstrated benefit in. Um, we should talk about cost and access of these drugs. Uh, what's being done in that space to make sure that results of trials can actually be implemented in patients living with disease? Yeah, well, I'm not a payer, so I can't really speak on their behalf, but I think the general reluctance uh, to uh, improve access to medications like this uh, has stemmed from, you know, partially the cost of the medications and partially uh, until very recently um, lack of compelling uh, outcome data beyond weight loss uh, in patients that don't have type 2 diabetes. Uh, well, that's changing rapidly. We heard the top line results of SELECT with 20% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, so MI stroke, deaths from cardiovascular causes. And now we have STEP half path data showing substantial improvements in symptoms and physical limitations as well as exercise function and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So clearly this is not just weight loss. Um, and I uh, believe and certainly hope that uh, payers who are ultimately are responsible for access to patients uh, will be compelled by these results as much as we are in the clinical community. Certainly a reduction in the heart failure hospitalizations, while that was a secondary endpoint, was a very important one to demonstrate because of that argument that perhaps the health status improved because of the weight loss. But then with the reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, you know, those tend to be longer than the average hospitalization, and there's a lot of costs that those accrue. So from a payer perspective, there's indirect costs that could be saved. Right, and beyond that, you know, other endpoints that we collected, you know, marked reduction in inflammation, a substantial reduction in anti-ProVNP, consistent with a decongestive effect of semaglutide. You know, I think it's pretty clear that, especially in this patient population, that we went to great lengths to make sure that these were people with clearly well-established and symptomatic heart failure. Mm -hmm. That this is not just, you know, while well, you lose weight and feel better, what we're showing is that the heart failure itself gets better. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're demonstrating that through various endpoints and mechanisms of this trial. Fantastic. Well, thank you for spending time with us and discussing these exciting results. And we look forward to the next steps in your research program. My pleasure. It's always good to be with you, Harriet. Thank you, Michael.